humor to build trust. Before we get going, please stand up if you're able to. Please stand up. <clears throat> little jazz hands, little jazz hands. <laughs> Loosen it up. Okay, now you're going to put your hands palm to palm. And when I say go, you're going to look around the room, front, side, or back. And any time that you catch eye contact with someone, you're going to look away and then give your best nerdy giggle, like, hee, hee. <laughs> Okay, you go for two or three of them. Ready? Go. <laughs> All right, three, two, one. All right, thank you. You can take your seats. Oh, I can't believe you did that. That was awesome. <laughs> oh, thanks for entertaining that. I even heard my mom cackling over there somewhere. Hi, Mom. Uh, well, I like that exercise. It's an improv activity from my improv classes, and I do it because it's silly, it's fun, and it gives us a little laugh. Wouldn't it be great if we could do a lot more of that? at work. We spend so much of our time doing work or finding the right job, interviewing for the right job, driving to and from work, all of that. So why not make work awesome? That is the question that led me to my research and my career as a professor and corporate leadership trainer. If I asked you, though, how would you make work more fun? Maybe you're thinking, oh, I'll sprinkle in some more jokes. I'll bring a funny story to my next meeting. <sighs> Maybe I'll sprinkle some sweet memes into my slide decks. <laughs> yeah, that'll kick things up a notch, right? Well, it can, but what if it's offensive? What if it's aggressive? What if it's inappropriate for work. Even self-deprecating humor is not the best leg to stand on when you have better options available. That's because humor at work is like a shitty hotel. It's fun to travel, but we're not all going to be that comfortable. Humor that builds trust shouldn't isolate people or groups or come at their expense. And that's why you got to be careful. That's also why most people avoid it. But you don't have to. Once you know how to use these great and effective humor techniques, you can use them too. They're not that hard. And it's sorely needed. That's because humor, or that, <laughs> that's not because humor, humor we need. That's because sadly, the overwhelming majority of the global workforce, 85% according to Gallup, are experiencing low levels of employee engagement. That means that most of us working adults around the world are mentally checked out from our work, we're unmotivated, we're actively disengaged. <sighs> well, at the core of this issue, it's a thing called vertical trust. Vertical trust is that type of trust between leaders and employees. <clears throat> we need more of that. We can use humor to fix it, though. And there's actually lots of awesome research showing that it's more than just a possibility. The other good news is I'm going to show you about collaborative humor techniques. And the best part of those is you can make the person you're talking to do all the hard work. Uh, that's a free gift from me to you. And in an effort to bridge this gap between uh, academic research and real-world business practice and leadership development, I began experimenting and conducting studies. I wanted to see if these collaborative humor exercises could build trust. So I measured their impact on the levels of trust within work groups. If that, uh, if that doesn't sound amazing, you might want to know, though, creating humor is great for our brains. Like a good cardio workout for the mind. Humor researchers Amir and Biederman, they led a study that demonstrated how uh, humor activates tons of brain activity in our neocortex learning brain more so than almost any other social activity. Yeah. But more importantly, creating humor, not just listening to it, but creating it, that was like superhero brain exercises on steroids. 
I got hooked on all this research after I had four spine surgeries. Uh, there was a bone tumor that was choking my spinal canal. It was removed. I'm here. We're good. But it was removed right before the irreparable damage was done. Since I was living on free time after that, I decided it's time to leave behind that busy lifestyle, time to change careers. So I started studying humor. And I wanted to finish my PhD with a smile. In the beginning, I didn't know where to start. I, uh, I remember this one study. It was um, this guy, Dr. Bill Hamps. He talked about this link between intimacy and humor and how they're so strongly connected. Then it was realized, well, the key ingredient of intimacy is trust. So humor and trust were hypothesized to have a strong link. A handful of us are still researching that link. Many others have published articles about their research showing how humor leads to better work satisfaction, better work performance, better organizational culture, better leadership, communication, creativity, problem solving. The list goes on forever. Dr. Romero, one of my favorites, he found in his study that individual use of humor leads to more humor in groups. That's like a perpetuating cycle of fun where humor breeds more humor. So how do we create this collaborative humor that builds trust? Just like when you're getting to know somebody, it happens through questions. Through questions. That way it's more back and forth, it's more social, spontaneous, organic. Unlike comedians who use prepared stories and jokes to entertain an audience. When you want to give someone that power of creating humor and all that great brain stuff and the trust, you ask them creative questions that encourages divergent thinking, humorous thinking. So, for example, Stephanie, how was that traffic in from Boston today? Instead, you could ask, what would aliens say about traffic? Or you could ask Michael, instead of that question about his recent work trip, what would dogs say about work travel? You're more than likely going to get a funny response because the answers are coming from them at the spur of the moment. Your questions provoke those funniness, the, the funniness that people have within them. You can create these own questions yourself, too, by simply changing out one of the words or nouns in a question to a completely ridiculous one. Uh, like that Mad Libs game where you fill in the blanks a little bit. All right. Here's some more examples. Standard questions, work questions. Let's make them ridiculous. You see how easy that is? There's this thing called the benign violation theory. Dr. McGraw, Dr. Warren, they had offered us a code for what we find funny. And their theory uncovers that humor is found when there's something acceptable, something violated, and that there's distance from that violation. And the distance, what that means is, for example, it's not funny to joke to someone about their disability. That's, there's no distance there. Okay? So in collaborative humor, though, you're taking a normal question and adding in the fun by giving it that violation or that incongruity with the ridiculous word. In my recent study, I wanted to see if this could really help people build trust at work. So in my study, I measured the level of trust in a work group, and then after that same group went through my collaborative humor workshop, I measured their level of trust again. It did build trust among leaders and their staff. Outside of the compelling data, the quantitative jump in trust from their before and after surveys, the thing that I found most astonishing was the qualitative interview responses, what they actually said about their experience. One leader I remember said, that was the most fun we've ever had at work. We're in a much healthier place now because of it. Inside the workshop, we practiced creating these silly questions and having our colleagues answer them. And it's more than just entertaining. As you can imagine, the personalities are revealed creating really special moments for the people in those teams. In my study and other studies about group humor, it's been established that these techniques help reluctant people to open up. It allowed us to reduce how we censor ourselves. It built enthusiasm, creativity. It even allowed people to build a tolerance for looking silly. And I've seen that happen so many times. All right, so here's where we're at so far. We've got 
Humor can increase employee engagement and trust. We've got number two is humor, when positive and non-aggressive, can perpetuate the use of more humor, especially in groups, which impacts overall corporate culture. And three, we need this because billions of working adults are just mentally checked out from their work. All right. Uh, let's talk about how you can insert this into real life because we're not going to go around asking about aliens and traffic every day. Um, even if you get stumped, I'll show you what to do. Let's say you're working on a big project. It's a good project. And you're excited to go to this meeting. You go into this meeting. You're sitting in the conference room, and you're waiting for the project manager to show up. You're sitting there. You're sitting there. They show up late. Instead of doling out the usual death stare, Cue the collaborative humor and just ask them, what would Shrek say about project management? Or let's say, we've all been those people, you're hovering outside the conference room, the previous meeting has run over time, and you're sitting there with your colleagues like vultures wishing they would just die already. <laughs> Cue the collaborative humor and ask them, what would Dr. Evil do about this situation? Or this, this one, maybe you'll, uh, you'll remember, the conference room technology. It's acting up as it does. You're 18 minutes into a 30-minute meeting. The screen's not working. People are echoing on the Skype. But the whole thing's a mess. Cue the collaborative humor and just ask them, what would babies say about how we run our work meetings? Or if you want the Mike Myers trifecta, what would Wayne and Garth do? <laughs> Sometimes at work, a company email goes out, and a thousand reply alls clog up your inbox. Sometimes people make stinky food in the microwave, and they leave their dirty dishes in the break room sink. Uh, sometimes the elevator smells like a fart. But these, all of these things are just golden opportunities to cue the collaborative humor. These creative questions can diffuse the tension and increase trust. Yeah. All right, so... Let's say uh, you're, in, you're in a situation and you can't think of the collaborative question right offhand. Here's what you're going to do if you're stumped. Another way to build trust with humor. You could bring any conversation into the weirdest place. The weirdest food. What's your weirdest meeting? Your weirdest project? Your weirdest personal professional moment? That weird Craigslist guy that bought your old Wi-Fi router? Any of that stuff. You can take it there because then you can find humor in all the stories we already have within ourselves, and that's always a fun place to find it. Or a work example, let's, uh, you gotta go to procurement. You gotta go to procurement. You're waiting on this PO you requested. So you go in there and you're like, hey Tom, where's that purchase order I requested, damn it. That's kind of salty. Maybe instead you do some collaborative humor and say, hey Tom, what's the weirdest thing you've ever had to buy? As someone who's worked in purchasing, I can guarantee some fun with that one. Or if you've got to make small talk with the CEO, don't talk about the weather. Ask about their weirdest leadership experience. Okay, so that's what you do if you're stumped. You take it to the weird place. Because life is too short not to have fun at work. Humor can add the fun. It can add the trust if it's positive, collaborative, and not aggressive. <sighs> yeah. I want to imagine a world, and I hope you'll imagine one with me, where you go to work and you can always hear someone laughing. That's a place I think we should all go together. So please remember, bring your creative questions and bring on the weirdness. Thank you. <laughs>